to be honest with you, we all make mistakes. And God doesn't want us to be perfect. He really just wants us to be genuine. He wants us to be real. He wants us to understand that God has a life plan for us. And the perception of that is that we are going to make mistakes and we are going to goof up. But in that, we can't allow the perception of life to change the reality of truth. Sometimes we don't want to deal with reality. Sometimes we get on Facebook and Facebook is a perception of what truth really is. And I, I just wrote this. I don't mean to brag, but my Facebook friends are smarter than yours. They read more interesting books, and they have wittier observations about life, and they give their time, resources, and energy for most important causes. Have great kids. They take wonderful vacation, dream jobs. If, if these people weren't my, in my news feed, I would just fo quit following them. See, don't get me wrong. I love scrolling through Facebook and snapshots of the perfect, perfect families and perfect vacations, and everything is wonderful, and everything's great, and wonderful times. But in reality... That is a perception of reality. Everybody can put the best picture on Facebook. Everybody can put the best vacation on Facebook. But in reality, it is a staged picture at best. Staged at best. Because sometimes we want us and want them to think my life is perfect. And guess what? Our lives are not perfect. Jesus died on the cross so our imperfect life can be made perfect for our life to be something that's genuinely real. I want you to read with me Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. It says, so stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all part of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands in good for good works, and then be generous to others in need. Don't use foul, abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing you that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as the types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. The definition of reality. Reality is the state of things as they actually exist, rather than as they may seem to appear or might be imagined. The definition of perception is the way you think about or understand someone or something. The way you think or the way that you perceive something. You know, life can change in a second. The life as you know can change. Uh, I got a phone call yesterday from uh, our, our church family. Uh, it's uh, uh, the, the Sneeds. They, they uh, sing on the praise team. Seneca. Seneca, are you here? Where are you at? Oh, he's right over here. Seneca has an 11-year-old boy that was over at his friend's house, and they were swimming. And uh, uh, Joshua couldn't swim. So as they were playing in the pool, his friend saw Joshua on the bottom of the pool. Drowned. They got him out of the bottom of that pool. And they got him up to the side of the pool and they did CPR. And an 11-year-old boy was dead. And that 11-year-old boy is now alive. Amen. Life changes. Reality is, it is real. Threats are real. And if we try to live in a fairy tale society in a perceived world that does not exist, we have not a real idea of what God has in store for our life. We have to have reality. Reality. Conflicts arise when two people insist on their own perception of reality, thinking they are right. 
Each person may be sincere in their desire to surrender their will, but each are looking at this situation from different perspectives. Our perspectives tell us more about ourselves and about the issue that's at hand. Jesus says, uh, Jesus warns us not to judge lest we judge ourselves. When we criticize, what we're criticizing is from our perspective. What we think, what we thought is our perspective. You know, in that video we just watched, you know, what we do is, is important, but who we are is much more important. What's deeper in our soul? You know, we could stand up and somebody would say, you're doing a wonderful job and how great that is. But the people that know us the well, that know what we do, that walk by us, that talk to us, they really know who we are. And they would not stand up and give us applause because they truly know when we live in a perception instead of reality, what happens is we look at ourselves and we believe the condemnation instead of the conviction of God and we start wondering. So what are those faulty perceptions? What happens when we live in a faulty perception? I, I want to list a few of them. The first one is uh, we live in exaggeration. We live in exaggeration mode. We pwn to exaggerate, to magnify our perception that life is perfect. Um, as we said, most of us put the best pictures on Facebook. And, and if somebody posts a picture of you on Facebook and you don't like, you hurry up and what? Delete. Man, I look fat. I don't want that picture. I, I was taking my boy up to Fort Hayes this week and took a couple picture, and uh, I was sitting over on the side, and, and uh, I wasn't aware of the way I looked when the picture was taken. <laughs> Needless to say, that picture did not make it on Facebook because I looked at it and said, ooh, delete, 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 delete. Don't put that thing on there. I don't want people to actually see how fat I am. I want to hide my fat, and if I hide it, then they won't know it, but then, you know, they'd look at everything else or they already know. But sometimes we exaggerate on who we look like or what we want. One picture makes us seem like we're, nothing's going wrong in our lives. Everyone is happy, not stressed, or not worried. Or the other side of that, sometimes we post our worries on Facebook, our fears, our anxieties, and that's not reality either. The fears and the realities of what could take place, we throw up all over the place. Sometimes it's a picture-perfect world, or sometimes, oh me, world. And sometimes we need to take a reality check. And the fears that you're going through doesn't need to be posted all over the world, nor does the fake reality. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, uh, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all comprehension will keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So let me give you, as your pastor, a words of advice. Before you post, pray. Wouldn't that change a lot of things? Before you post, pray. Before your fears of your anxieties at one o'clock in the morning go all over the place, Let's pray about it. What does God want for me? Is this the truth? Am I trying to bring out a perception or am I bringing out reality? Well, I found some perceptions and realities in life. Trying to be the perfect beach photo. Look at this. Trying to be the perfect beach photo. But in all actuality, this is reality. You're losing your kids. Okay? And now, you like going to McDonald's. Okay, you could tell I like going to McDonald's. Do you remember this one? Two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Remember that? Can anybody else do that? I practiced that for like two hours last night. Two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun, a Big Mac. They, they try to let you think that's what you're going to get. But when you go in, you're going to get the one on the right, right? That is like a nasty hamburger. But the perception is I'm going to get the big one, the good one. And then what about going shopping with your kids? Don't you remember this? The perfect shopping spree, going around and talking and your kids are just playing around. This is reality though, right? <laughs> that is reality. Get over here crying about everything, don't want anything. And then you go on your vacation. You go to Disneyland and you think everything's gonna be wonderful. The one on the left, perfect picture. But you get out of Disneyland at nine o'clock in the morning, you're exhausted, your kids are hanging all over you, you're broke, you spent so much money, and all you wanna do is get to the car. Let, why don't you go to the pool and go swim and let mom and I have about a two hour nap and go have uh, our own time. And then uh, the perception of a new baby coming home. 
sleeping in mom's arms. In reality, it's kicking and fighting all night long. That is what true reality is. But what, what we think is sometimes we exaggerate what the truth is. But the second thing we do in we talking about a perception is we have selective memory. We don't listen to people who disagree with our position. Sometimes we only listen to people that believe us and that agree with us. We selectively direct our conversation in areas that are favorable to what pleases us. So what happens if, if somebody doesn't agree with us or somebody knows our reality and we want them to believe our perspective of a false reality, we kind of just stay away from them. We don't allow them. We don't give them time. So we have a selective memory of who is going to get into our life. In James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, it says, What is causing the quarrels and fightings among you? Do they come from the evil desires that war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme to kill to get it? You are jealous and what others have, but you don't get it. So you fight and wage and take upon yourselves. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask God, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. You want only what you will give you pleasure. Sometimes we have selective memory, and sometimes we get frustrated when somebody doesn't agree with us, so we stay away from them. But you know what? Facebook has something. Facebook has a filter, and it's called our friends. And if we do not like or if we do not invest in people on our Facebook, they go to the bottom of our list, and they quit going through our news feed. So when we don't see what they are going through over a period of time, it's because they are not like us. But, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty conservative dude. So on my Facebook wall, it has all the conservative values. It has the, the Christian stuff. It has the, the political perspective that I have because I look at it and I read it. But you probably won't see too much stuff that's on the liberal view on my face because I don't really look at it. So I only stay with what I like, and I like only what I like. And uh, here at the church, I'm going to go off topic for 30 seconds. So if you get mad at me, this is the time you're going to get mad at me. Just being honest. We've had way too much stuff from Christians that act more like ungodly individuals on Facebook than I care to imagine. They call themselves Christians, but they treat non-believers worse than any other non-believer would treat anybody. And then the very next time, they put up there a scripture about how much God loves them. And I'm just saying... What we must do as a believer in Jesus Christ, we must be a light in a dark world. Whether it is on Facebook or in your life, what we must do is not condemn. We don't have to condone, but we do have to love. We have to experience. I want you to think, what if it's your child? What if it's your aunt? What if it's your sister that does something that you don't necessarily agree with are you going to love them or are you going to condemn them? In Facebook, on a public social media network, what we must do is we must be the Christian, period. Love them. You don't have to condone what they do, but we do have to love them through what they do. Yeah, somebody give me an amen. amen. Yeah, I got two of them. All right. Uh, sometimes we come up with wrong conclusions. Wrong conclusions. When we live in a perception, we come up with wrong conclusions. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. What does that mean? Going from the last point, you do not have to be their judge. You can be their friend. Whether you agree with them or not, you can be their friend. You do not have to live like them, but you can love them. It is often uh, misrepresented of the, seeing the experience that they're going through. Some people take things too personally and become frustrated, upset, angry because of small disagreements. When we take the state of a statement and we get mad at the person and stop a friendship because of somebody, what they said, or how they said it, we take a statement and we say, you know what, they're done. I'm done with them. What God is trying to say is, you know what, what the church needs, what you need, is you need to be a light in a dark world. And saved people can't get saved. 
Unsaved people need to be saved. And if the saved people will not infiltrate the unsaved, how are the unsaved ever going to see Jesus Christ? We must get into their lives. Do not come up with wrong conclusions. God will do the judging. God will take care of everything. And that leads us to number four. We react to people based on past experiences. Sometimes we react negatively to people based on their bad experience from their past. And we've talked about this many times. Everybody has scars. Everybody has a past. Everybody has wounds. I had a sermon out here and I had beads, some pink beads and some blue beads. And it was a marriage sermon. And, and the, the whole idea of the sermon with, within this glass was what is in you is going to come out of you, no matter who's around you. It's, if it's in you, if you're angry, if you're frustrated, if you're mad, if you're depressed, whatever's in you, when you are bumped, it's going to come out of you. It may not be your husband. It may not be your spouse. It may not be your parents. It may be a you bead. And this is the idea that sometimes we have to look at what is our issue because sometimes we respond negatively to somebody just because of our past experiences. Our previous hurtful encounters remind us of something that provokes a problem from the past and brings that feeling or that perception up in a way that we are so overwhelmed that we have no idea how to handle it. And sometimes somebody that has a bad perception of what reality truly is can live their life on the thread of anger. They're just waiting for somebody to chap them off. They're just waiting for something to fall. And they're waiting. And if somebody says a word or does something, they go off. And it's all not about what they said. It's about the emotion or the temperament about how they handled it. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, it says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, but that I've already rushed to perfect perfection. But I press toward the process of the perfection of Jesus Christ who first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the things of the past and looking forward to the things of head. I press on to reach to the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, has called me. I want to focus on forgetting those things in the past. We react to people based on our past experiences. And sometimes we just need to say, you know what? The past is behind me. Now I know that's very difficult. I know that the way that we perceive life and the way that we think people perceive us, our past has a major impact within our life. And, and I understand some of the terrible things that has happened to many people within this church. And I understand it. I've talked to you about it. I, I have prayed you through it. But at the same time, if we want to move into the future, first thing you have to do is you have to say, Lord, give me the ability to forgive Give me the ability to heal. Give me the ability, because forgiveness is a very spiritual matter. Somebody chap you, it's very difficult to forgive, but God can do anything. With God's help, we can forgive and we can move on. And the ointment of God's love and forgiveness can take us to a whole nother lover. So what we have to do is we have to understand our past will influence us, especially when we look at perception in a prop, improper way. So what are the consequences of faulty perceptions? Here's what we do. We go on attack mode. We go on attack mode. And I found this little quote. Reality is the leading cause of stress amongst those who have it in touch with it. In other words, if you're in touch with reality, it's going to cause them some stress. Because you deal with things in a different way. You deal with truth. Some people think that good, a good offense is a very good defense. So when there's a problem coming on, the first offense is I'm going to stand up and be defensive. I'm going to be critical. Critical. I'm going to stand up and fight. Instead of communicate, we fight. We go into attack mode. And when we go into attack mode, aggression sent is aggression met. And when we go into attack mode, nobody ever wins. When people complain about others, they're off attacking the different perception. Instead of talking about life, reality, they try to deal with a perception that cannot be true. In Romans 14, 19, it says, so then let Follow after the things which make for peace and things whereby we may edify one another. We can't go into attack mode. And the second thing is the blame game. Anybody ever go into the blame game? 
You don't want to take responsibility for it so it's your fault or it's Satan's fault or it's his fault or it's her fault. Most disagreements are caused by different perceptions that are created by different realities. We do not see things the same way. Instead of dealing with the reality, we deal with the perception of the reality, and so we are not on the same page. And instead of coming back and talking about it, what we have done is we believe a distorted view of the truth, perception. Some people will blame another for the devil or whatever they think as long as they do not have to look at themselves. Listen to this. If we shove the perceived problem off to another, we will not recognize our own limited perception of the matter. If we, no, if I have to be right all the time, I am wrong most of the time. Somebody give me an amen. amen. Sometimes we just have to say, I was wrong. My perception of the issue was not reality. I'm sorry. Forgive me. You cannot correct your mistakes by pointing out the mistakes of others. The only way that you're going to correct your mistakes is by looking at your own. If I look at your mistake, you know, I could, I, I, you know, counseling is a piece of cake. I could come up and, and you tell me your problems. I could say this, 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 and this. And do it. Fix it. D just fix it. Stop it. I can pick out your problems all day long. But you know what? I have a hard time looking in the mirror and fixing my own problems. But I can pick out your problems, and I can tell you how to fix your problems. But what's very difficult is looking in that mirror and be self-aware of my own. You cannot correct your mistakes by pointing out mistakes of others. But what we must do is walk with life through others. In Philippians 2, it says this. Paul tells us to do all things without complaining or disputing. But children of God above reproach in a crooked and perverse generation among whom we appear as light in this world. The third thing we do is when we have a faulty perception is we win at all costs. We win at all costs. Anybody play Monopoly? Isn't Monopoly the most frustrating game in the world? And here it is, it is a cutthroat game. You sit around, let's play Monopoly. The kids are around in 30 minutes. If you're anything like me, in 30 minutes, I am done. Either I am going to dominate every, every property I own is going to have a hotel on it. I'm going to bankrupt you. I want to make sure that you die. It's a game of Monopoly. But that's how we do it. The sure, firm, winning battle. We cannot win the battle by dominating the game. We have to win at all costs. And if we have that mindset that I will win and you will lose, we both lose. The aim of an argument should not be victory. The aim of the argument should be progress. Am I winning by moving forward? If I want to argue to win, it's my way or the highway. And you know what most people take when it's my way or the highway? They take the bus on the highway. <laughs> they are tired of it. They may stay with you. They may look at you. They may have a good time with you for five or six or seven years. But I tell you what, if it has to be my way or the highway, sooner or later, that gets old. And if we have to win at all costs, it'll never work. James 1, 19 and 20. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Slow. Sometimes the best thing to do is to back down. And if we have to win at all costs, it's not a game. It is a very serious game of life. And uh, when we have a bad perception of reality, what happens is if we have to win, um, we're going to go through life very miserable. And then here's what happens to some people. We refuse to reach out. We refuse to reach out. And the idea is your opinion is not my reality. And that is a true statement. I cannot get my identity because of your opinion. I want to respect your opinion, but your opinion is not my reality. Because if I have to have my reality based on what everybody thinks of me or what everybody says, I will never be who God wants me to be. I must understand, but here's what we do. We refuse to reach out because of their past or because of their problems. But here's the, every, even godly people get very ungodly at times. Somebody say amen. I mean, can't we relate to that video? I mean, we're, go we're going to be the man of the year. 
but yet our kids want to play with us, and oh, I'm too busy. We see a little old man broke down on the street. Uh, I'm too busy. We get mad at the laundry mat. We get mad at somebody that they weren't fast enough. We get mad at the waitress after church because our food wasn't perfect. We lose our testimony. What we do is we just stop reaching out. All we need is to God to help us a little, be, a little kinder, a little blinder to the faults of those around us and love. We do not let their opinion define us, but what we do is we have to respect everyone around us. How do we do that? We respect by showing them God in us, who God created us to be. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So often in church world and in family world, what we do during conflict resolution is we sweep it under the carpet. Anybody good at sweeping stuff under the carpet? We don't deal with it. We just sweep it. We hide it. But then something takes place. My favorite old TV show is called Hogan's Heroes. Anybody ever watch Hogan's Heroes? Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> Hogan's Heroes is the bomb. But you know what Hogan's Heroes is? It's a rerun. I've seen it a million times. I could tell you what's going to take place before it even happens. Because it is a rerun. I have watched it, I like it, and I enjoy it. Here's our fights. We sweep it under the carpet. But the rerun is about ready to happen. Oh, you did what? Five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, last night, you did the same thing. Whoa, 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 whoa. I thought we dealt with that. We didn't deal with that. We just swept it under the carpet until it's beneficial to me, and then I'll just pull it back up, and I like to watch me another rerun. Anybody like reruns? Reruns on TV are fun. Reruns in life stink. Because if we don't deal with the problem, the problem is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and sooner or later it is going to explode. We refuse to reach out. We must reach out. Number five, we judge others by the way we react. And this is a good quote. Life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you react to it. Isn't that true? When we can deal with life, when we have a reality, 10% of what really happens I can deal with, but 90% is how we react, how we react. Temperamental differences often become wrong judgments and differences in perceptions. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, this is, um, if, if any verse in the Bible is for relationships. This verse is a perfect relationship. It's, it's called being self-aware. And being self-aware is understanding my own issues. Before I can put my issues on you, you have to understand what your issues are. Matthew 7, 3 through 5. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye. And he says a heavy word, hypocrite. First, go get the log in your own eye, and then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Isn't that revolutionary? Wouldn't that be awesome if we would be able to be self-aware enough to know, you know what, he's got some problems, I've got some problems, you've got some problems. Why don't I simply deal with me. And after I deal with me, maybe then I can help you. But if I can't deal with my own, if I can't deal with my own issues, if I can't see my own reality, if I have a, a warped perspective of what I am going through, I'll never be able to help. What is steadfast to some is firmness or conviction to others. What is weakness to one may be gentleness to another. What is illogical to one is the institution to another. Do not evaluate a person on your own standard alone, but on your temperament and God's help. And I like that the last verse. How can you think of, of saving your friend? Let me help you by getting rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye. Past. Not just see. You see, past is an action. If I want to help somebody, if I just confront them, 
get mad at them, say whatever I want to say, put a little blob, bl a blurb on Facebook, write them a text, send them a message, get a phone call, and all it is is the criticizing aspect. I am not helping them. I am hurting them. If I love somebody enough, I can communicate to them to get past their issue. Not to enjoy their issue, not to tell everybody else about their issue, not to let everybody else know that somebody else has a problem. We all have problems. Let us deal with our own eyes and let us get past our own issues so we can help them. Because if we do not, we are not gaining a friend. We are losing a friend. And the last one, um, we reject the person instead of their viewpoint. Um, we reject the person instead of the viewpoint. Never forget these three types of people in your life. This is good. You better write it down. Who helped you in your difficult time? Who left you in your difficult time? And who put you in your difficult time? Never forget those three people. There's going to be people around you that help you in your difficult time, that put you in your difficult time. What we have to do is we have to understand, I love them. This is rejecting the sinner instead of the sin. We can't do that. You know, in our media today, sin is rampant. Our culture is bad. The job of the church is to rescue a lost and dying world from hell. Okay, the job of the church is not to come in here and sing songs and enjoy church, right? The job of the church, the mandate, Jesus came to seek and to save those which are lost. What do lost people do? Sin. Well, a lot of, a lot of saved people sin, but lost people sin. What we must do is sometimes when they do things that we do not agree with, that's not the Christian way, <laughs> no, 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 not in my church. But what we should do is we should say, you are more than welcome into my church. Now, you may not be a deacon at our church because I have enough problems with my deacons now, but you, you could come in. I just joke, and I got a deacon board meeting later. later. I'll pay for that. But what we want to do is we want to reject the sin, but love the sinner. Because once the sinner gets Jesus, the sin will not be mandate within his life. He can start moving forward into his Christian faith. Remember when you were first saved? You remember when you first started that journey? What, what, if, what if the first time you went to church, you had to stand up and say, let me tell you everything I've done. You, no, it's under the blood of Jesus. What we can say is, I do not have to be perfect. I can be real. I can be honest. I can be genuine because I am self-aware. We cannot reject the sinner. We can reject the sin. We don't have to agree with the sin. We, we hit on this a few months ago when, when same-sex marriage started being real. And it started being a big deal. And I made a statement because it was such a big deal within our church. And I, I just want us to get a mindset. It's more serious for a Christian to live in sin than it is for an ungodly person to live in sin. Because we are supposed to be bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's no difference between a same-sex marriage outside of the church than it is for a church family to have a sexual relationship with somebody else after they're saved which is more condemning to God. So what we have to do as a church, we need to clean up our boat so we can communicate to them in their boat. But if we can't clean up our boat, our church, the church, has lost impact because the purity of the body has lost its savor. What we must do is we must say, I want God to glorify in me. I am not going to throw away an opportunity to, lead, to lead a sinner to Jesus because of their position of their sin. What I want to do is I want to look past their problem. And I want to look deep into their eyes. And I want to say, Jesus loves you. And you are welcome. Because if we do not welcome sinners to the church, we cannot lead them to the Lord. Amen. And what we have to do, you know, I use this illustration all the time, and I 
And when I go up to a cupboard and I pull out a glass, first thing I do in that glass is what? I look in the glass. I look in the glass, and if the glass is clean, I'll put my water, my Coke, my ice, and I'll fill it up and I'll drink out of that glass. But if I get up to the cupboard, and the boys have been home, and they didn't wash the dishes, and they drank out of it and put a Coke in, and they put it back in the cupboard. I don't know about your kids, but that's what my kids would do. And I looked down, and I looked at it, and it was dirty. Am I going to drink out of that dirty glass? I'm going to put that glass in the dishwasher. I'm going to put it in the sink, and I'm going to reach up and get another glass. That's exactly what Jesus wants to do with your life. He wants to say, Jill, it's your turn. I'm pulling you off the shelf, and I want you to minister to Debbie. Your glass is clean. I'm filling you up. Go pour it out. And when we listen to God's voice, and we are not condemning them, but we are loving them, God can take our clean vessel of life and pour it out into somebody else's life. We may not be like them. They may have sin that we do not understand, but we are a sinner saved by Jesus Christ, trying to get into their life so they can be saved just like us. If we have that mindset, we will not lose the perception what God wants us to have. In Ephesians 4, it says, Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ's sake, has forgiven you. I've heard it many times. Perception is reality. Well, if we only look at perception, perception could be your reality. But perception is what we think about reality. Reality is truth. I've always wondered if that would be true. The older I get, the more I believe. That's what people think. That their perception is always right and yours is always wrong. But here's what I believe. I believe that God wants us to be real. I believe he wants us to trust in him. I believe he wants us to quit listening to the lies of Satan and start living a life of truth, a life of reality. Knowing that everybody's perception of everything is an opinion. It's what they think about the problem. We fight over perceptions. We don't deal with realities. Church, we have to deal with the reality. And the reality is, that we are living in a world that needs Jesus. And the church is losing its impact if we do not stand up, love them, help them, encourage them, give them a tool in which they can see Jesus Christ so they can see Jesus Christ high and lifted up and they can give their life to Christ. The only way that's going to change this world is Jesus. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton is not going to change this world. They didn't create this world, and they didn't die for this world. You know who did? What's his name? Jesus. Jesus is the only hope for this world. Let's not count on the politics. Let's not count on the government. Let's count on God. And you know what we are? We are Christ-like ones. They first called Christians because they looked like they had been with Christ. We need to be Christians. Follow after him. Our perception, let's not have a distorted view of God. Let's have a reality check of what God did and who God is and let God work within our lives. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we love you. And Lord, sometimes life is hard. And sometimes we just need your touch. We need your hand of God upon our life. And Lord, as we look at our perceptions, Lord, we really don't know what to do sometimes. But Lord, give us that strength. Give us that knowledge. Allow us to stand in the face of adversity. Allow us to have a tender heart to those that are outside of the body of Christ. Allow us not to fight to get our way Allow us not to have a bad perception of somebody that's not like us. Allow us to truly know that you have called us to change the world. And we do that by changing our life, by being the vessel that you want us to be. Lord, we thank you for that. We ask you for that. 
In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen.